God's bringing us through him now. Brother Ruckman. All right. All right, if you have the Bible this morning, let's turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Now, this is a, a Bible conference, so you ought to have a little Bible study here along with this preaching. So we'll give you a little Bible study this morning. And uh, we'll go down kind of deep. You know, some of the Bible is uh, milk, some of it's bread, some of it's uh, uh, meat, some of it's honey. And uh, this morning we'll get into some, some barbecue pork. Uh, it may kind of upset some of your tummies, but you need a little straw meat once in a while. Out of Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel chapter 2, let's you read there for a while, beginning at verse 31. And verse 31, read down verse 31, down through verse 35. Just read that over there, and then we'll talk about it here in a minute. And Daniel chapter 2 there, verse 31 to 35, that's a description of a dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. And old Nebby's up too late at night eating pizza or something, has a nightmare and upset stomach. And when he wakes up in the morning, he can't remember what he dreamed. Uh, he could recall if the fellow repeated it, but they can't repeat it. And he called in all the wise men of Babylon there to try to uh, analyze the thing, and none of them could analyze it. And then he calls in Daniel, and Daniel's been praying about it, and Daniel's got the interpretation. And in 31 to 35, where you're reading there, the interpretation is given. Or at least the dream is given. He doesn't interpret it, but he tells the king what he dreamed. In the passage there, he says, you had this dream, and if when you had this dream, you said you dreamt about this uh, great image that stood before you. And he said the head of this image was gold. And he said, when you got down there to the arms and the breast of that uh, image, it was silver. And when you got on down there to the belly and the thighs, they were brass. And when you got on down the bottom of that thing, he said the legs were of iron. When you got down the toes, the toes were iron and clay. And then he, uh, in the dream, down verse 35, he says, you watched and saw, and pretty soon a, a stone uh, made without hands, stone cut out of a mountain, without hands, uh, hit that image, and hit that image on the feet. Now, that's the most important part of this thing to remember, is that when the stone came down, it hit the image on the feet. That's the most important part of this thing to remember, because if you don't get that right, you don't get the second coming of Christ right. And the stone comes down and hits his feet, and then that blows the whole mess away. It lands on the feet, and when it does, it naturally when the feet get cut out, that does away with the image. You can't stand up without any feet. So the whole image uh, blows away and becomes like the uh, chaff on the summer threshing floor, he says. Uh, it blows away with the wind, or as Mar uh, Margaret Mitchell said, uh, gone with the wind. And then when you look at this thing here, and he gets interpreting this thing, Daniel gives the interpretation, and come down to 37, verse 37, in the interpretation, he says, Thou, O king, art this head of gold. So this head of gold here at the top stands for a king. Thou, O king, art this head of gold. It's an individual. And by the same token, look at verse 39. The next kingdom that comes up will be then every part of that image not only refers to a king, but to a kingdom. It's dual. And when you get over there a little bit later in Daniel, you're going to find that same thing again. You're going to find over in Daniel when he gets talking about uh, 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 the seven kingdoms, uh, and talking about the seven kingdoms, he has the seven kingdoms uh, come out with uh, kings and kingdoms. Now it's very important that you remember that any part of an image or uh, uh, anything in Daniel's uh, dreams, or Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, uh, refer not only to uh, a king, but a kingdom. That's important. Not just a kingdom, a king. Not just a king, but a kingdom. That's very important. Because when you get the book of Revelation and start through there, you'll find that up uh, shows a beast out of the sea. And somebody said, that beast is just the ten federated Roman kingdom. No, it's not. It's a man. It's both. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, he said, Here that is mine that hath wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. So that thing that comes up in Revelation 13 with seven heads and ten horns is not just a kingdom. It's a man. You get it from here. Oh, now he starts here with this thing, and he has this stone come down. This stone comes down, hits the feet, and the feet are part clay and part iron. And as anybody can see, the, uh, the feet obviously have uh, it's got uh, five toes on it. 
So down comes this thing and smacks this thing on the bottom, and then this stone becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. Now we know, of course, what this stone represents, because the New Testament tells you. He says, the stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. A precious stone, elect stone. And Christ says about that stone, he said, you better look out for that stone, because the first advent, whoever stumbles on it shall be broken, but at the second advent, upon whomever it falls, it'll grind him to powder. So that's a stone that comes down there, it's called a, the cornerstone, a headstone. Now there's only one building in the world where a cornerstone is a headstone. And that's a pyramid. If it's a cornerstone, you lay the cornerstone of this building, it's over there, over there, over there, back yonder. But if it's a capstone, it's on the cap. It's the cap. Captain, capstan, capo, the same word. It's on top. And if it's, a, if it's a capstone or a headstone, it's on the top of the pyramid, there. Because the pyramid's only structure has five corners. And this building here has got uh, eight corners. One, two, three, four at the top, four at the bottom. Eight of them. If it's a cornerstone, only four. One here, or one there, or one there, or one there. But this thing has five of them. There's a cornerstone here, a cornerstone here, a cornerstone here, and a capstone there. And the capstone, the capstone has to be in the corner, so it's sitting up here. So if you have a dollar bill on you and pick out your dollar bill and look at the left side of your dollar bill, you'll find a pyramid sitting there. And the capstone's off it. Yeah. It's sitting up in the air. And there's an eye in the middle of the capstone. Like the thing was a living stone. You know what I mean? You, gotta be, <laughs> you see, when you can't figure out what's going on, you get a King James Bible, and then it gets clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. That's the stone the builders rejected. And when Christ came the first time, they're building this building. They got the thing all done right up to there. And they said, now we need a capstone to put upon it. And the Lord said, okay, here's the capstone. Gives them Christ. They say, well, that piece of junk, and threw it out. The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. And Christ says, if you're going along like this, in this age here, and you stumble on that stone, <laughs> uh, you'll be broken to pieces. But if that thing falls on you, it'll grind you to powder. The two advents. Well, now, see that picture of Daniel's image? I don't know how, how, how significant you know that thing is, but that is of great significance. In the first place, that statue shows that Darwin was crazy. <laughs> That's what that statue shows. You see, it begins with gold and it winds up with clay. It's degeneration. You don't begin from the clay and work up. You begin from heaven and fall down. So Darwin was nuts. He had this thing you go from you know, from puddle to paradise, the modern pilgrim's progress. <laughs> and you don't go from puddle to paradise, you go from paradise to the puddle. Well, you start up here at the intellectual facilities, and then come down to the emotional facility, the digestive facilities, and excretory facilities, and then down to the locomotion, and then down to the dirt. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The first thing that proves is that Mar the dumb is out of his mind. So if man's evolutionist, he's half crazy. See, Ruffin, I wish you could calling people out. Well, you might as well call them out. That's what they are. They're nuts. I mean, a man who believes in evolution is mentally sick. He's mentally disturbed. You say, why? There isn't any such thing. You say, where? Anywhere. It isn't a matter of animals from man, a man from animals. There's no evolution of anything. Nothing evolves. The word is not an English word. The word actually means to unroll something. It doesn't mean anything grows. It gets littler and littler. What evolves? Name me one thing that evolves. Nothing. You don't evolve, you mature. A thing can grow or mature or develop or be created or worked on, but it can't evolve. You see what? Anything. Anything. Take a bunch of dogs, take all the dogs in this town, turn them loose in the field and just let them evolve. <laughs> They'll turn out into wild mutts. Uh, a thing that doesn't take, that isn't worked on and and worked with and developed and worked on degenerates. You say, what? Anything. It isn't people. It's the sun, moon, stars. Everything falls apart. That's the universal law of life. Now, folks don't like to hear that. That's so negative. Oh, Ruckman, tell me I'm getting better. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> 
a ruckman tell me I'm getting younger. You're getting older. You're falling apart. Your teeth coming out. Your hair's coming out. Your feet getting flat. Your chest is falling. Your kidneys and liver going bad. You're going to drop dead. Have a, have a nice day. <laughs> you know, you know, you know. You see, that's why, why, why you can't make a living. Tell them that. Folks don't want to hear that. But it's true. I mean, uh, I, I, I know, I know makeup can take a few years off a woman's life. I know that. But sister, you can't fool a flight of stairs. <laughs> I mean, you think you're getting younger. Just try walking up six flights of stairs and see how it goes, you know. I mean, I'm, I'll be 71 this year and I'm still playing ice hockey. Last game of ice hockey I played was a month ago. I'm still playing goalie. I'm a gatekeeper and ice hockey man. I'm still playing ice hockey and racquetball, you know, and soccer and touch football, but I ain't kidding myself. The old gray mare ain't what she used to be, boy. I'll kid you not. <laughs> I mean, the fact is you're falling apart. Uh, how could a man have a used car and believe in evolution? You got stuff you got parked out there around this, this, this church. It's just a rolling pile of junk. I don't care if things are brand new Mercedes Benz. It's a rolling pile of junk. It'll fall apart. I used to walk by those car lots, you know, and look at those cars, you know, and covet them, you know, and this and that. After having the 17 of them, man, I don't covet nothing anymore. I mean, I'll go by and take one look. I don't know what they got there. $20 million worth of junk is what they got out there. That's, I know what's going to happen. You're going to buy the thing, and after a year, the clock doesn't work. <laughs> then the radio doesn't work. Then the heater doesn't work. And then it's the solenoid. And then it's the switch. And then the brakes need to be lining. And then it, the valves need to be ground. And then the whole thing just falls apart, man. The law of life is you begin at the top and you drop out. That's the law of life. I'll tell you something shocking. When you get saved, from the moment you get saved the day you die, you begin, you degenerate. When you're saved, that's when God comes in there and disturbs that entropy and that degeneration and imparts a new life. And from the moment it's part of the day you go home, it falls apart. Just like your physical birth. You're born and come in brand fresh. From that point on, you begin to fall apart. Now, the only way you can keep from falling apart is by an influx of something from outside. That's the law of physics. And, of course, none of the evolutionists believe it because they're not scientific. The most unscientific man you ever met in your life is an evolutionist. The law of life is there's always entropy in a closed system. What that means is there's always dissipation of energy and randomness developing unless an outside force comes in and injects something from the outside. Uh, why why'd you eat this morning? Stay alive. <laughs> Quit eating eight or nine months and watch what happens. You'll die <laughs> because the energy goes out. You have to have energy come in from the outside. When you get saved, if you lay down that Bible and quit praying, you will fall apart like a berry basket, and you'll be in worse shape than you were in for you saved. Amen. Of course, you'll still go to heaven, but the spiritual man is that you're destroyed. The natural tendency is down. You have to keep getting injections from something up there to keep the thing going. All right, we got. I hope we got that settled. Now, if you don't have that settled, then look at this. In 1933, Roosevelt took your gold away from you and took you off the gold standard and put you on silver. In 1960, when Kennedy came in, then he took the silver away from you and gave you a Federal Reserve note instead of a silver certificate. And then in 1990, without you knowing about it, <laughs> they took the brass out of your copper pennies and put in zinc. You go down. You never go up. You don't go from zinc to copper to silver to gold. You go from gold to dirt. When Solomon was king, silver was counted nothing other than the days of Solomon. Right now, you can't even get silver in a quarter. It's got copper in it. But they're not satisfied with that. Now <laughs> You can't get the copper. There's zinc in it. You know what happens next? Dirt. That's what happens next. It goes down. Now, you want to get that. I mean, there isn't a college professor anywhere in Ohio or Michigan that knows that, so just get a step ahead of them, you know, if you've got a King James Bible. Well, now it goes down like that. Now, he took you on down there through those kingdoms, and we know today what those kingdoms are, because in retrospect, that thing is in the past. And the past, we know what those kingdoms were. For example, we have no trouble with the first one, because the first one, uh, Daniel told you wh what it was. 
Daniel said, Thou, O king, art this head of gold. So we know what this one here is, that's Babylon. Now we know in retrospect, too, what the next one is, because history works it out and confirms it. This one is Media Persia. That's why he had two arms. One arm for Media, one arm for Persia. That takes care of that. Then we know what this one here is here. This is Greece, Alexander the Great. We know what this one here is Rome. Now we know something. We know that the rock didn't hit the legs, because when Christ came, Rome murdered him. Roman soldiers are, 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 are put him before Pilate. Roman soldiers nailed him. Roman soldiers put a spear through his side. So it's useless to say this is Christ coming back and getting rid of the Gentile kingdoms. Now his kingdom is spreading. Glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. That will work. Because when he came, he didn't destroy Rome. Rome destroyed him. So that thing hits the feet, not the legs. Which means that hasn't happened yet. But that rock coming is not the first coming of Christ. Because when he came, Rome was in power. And when this rock comes, somebody else is in power. And they're after Rome. Now, you've got to get that. If you don't get anything, you've got to get that. Once you teach that that thing is the first coming of Christ, you know what you have. You have Jesus Christ coming back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when he comes up from the dead, he sits down on the throne, begins to reign, and begins to spread the kingdom to get rid of the Gentile nations. Every Church of Christ preacher in the state of Michigan preaches that. Every Roman Catholic priest in the state of Michigan preaches that. That's called post-millennialism. All politicians are post-millennialists. Here's uh, Janet Reno and Willie and, and Hillary murdering a fellow out there in Waco, Texas, because he kept talking about the second coming of Christ and bringing in the kingdom. They're trying to bring in the kingdom right now. That's how he got into office. You can't be a politician without being post-millennial. Fellas, I don't believe the Bible. You have to go by the Bible whether you believe it or not. Fellas are going to get in office. You've got to say, put me in and things will get better. I'll fix up this. I'll fix up that. I'll fix up this. Then you vote for him. And then it falls apart. <laughs> Ruckman could never be a politician. I guess you gathered that by now. I mean, what if I got up and presented my program? All right, but if all you blacks want to go back to Africa, give you $1,000 and a free one-way ticket in the boat. You want that? All right, number two, close all the liquor stores permanently. Go back to Prohibition. I mean, keep the liquor out in the hills and the bootleggers and the gangsters where it belongs. That's where it belongs. Keep it where it belongs. Or number two, shut out all the pornographic and X-rated shops. Cut them, just shut them down. Number three, pass the law. If any man uh, suggests a gun control bill, you put him in jail for 90 days. A gun control bill of any kind. If he makes even a motion that way, treason. Throw him out, brother, against the government. Uh, next thing to do, uh, uh, I'm, see, you see, I'm not going to get any votes. <laughs> do you know there's a guy running for president right now named uh, Fleur? He ran this last time. And, of course, nobody voted for him. But he said his platform was the King James Bible. That guy's a character. I've known him for 25 years. And that fellow's going to run for president again at the end of this four years. And what he does, he goes to Washington. He has access to all the senators and congressmen because he's running for president. And he goes in there and puts this stuff on their desk about the King James Bible saying queers should be killed. Amen. <laughs> you know how many votes he's going to get. <laughs> but you take that thing. The only way to get folks to vote for you is tell them what good things are going to take place if they put you in. You see? Yeah, things are going to get better and better. Happy days are here again. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is tramping out. No, he ain't. You got some crackpot over master. Some demon possessed woman wrote that song. At the Julia Ward Howe or somebody like that wrote that mess. And that thing says, his, he, he's marching on the terrible swift sword, tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored, referring to white southerners. Why the grapes of wrath Christ tramps out are 200 million United Nations troops in Isaiah 63. And the blood goes all over him. His terrible swift sword, you talking about here this morning, it comes out of his mouth at the advent. That woman didn't see the advent. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. You dirty liar, you never have a day in your life. Your eyes have seen the glory, have they? No, they haven't. His truth is marching on. It is, huh? Oh, you're on evangelistic work. Have you noticed his truth marching on? Don't want to hear it. 
I've been out in the field for 44 years. There's less truth today than ever was in the last 44. Don't tell me his truth is marching on. What you talking about? The left, truth is falling in the street. I used to go to Beach and Vicks Church over there in, uh, you know, in, in Detroit. And I'd go there and that, that 4,000 people get up and sing, My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of... I'd just sit there. You don't about have to take a stand, brother. I mean, young people say it's so hard to go it alone. You, you'll have to go it alone at my age, man. I mean, I've sat there and just listened to them sing. They all stand there and punch and look at him, be, be a laugh, you know, boy, look at that southerner that was at the way I woke up. <laughs> I wouldn't get up and sing that blasphemy. You wouldn't catch me standing up and singing in the beauty of the lilies. Christ was born across the sea when he was born in a stable with his glory in his bosom and trying to figure as you and me. No, it doesn't. As he died to make men holy. No, he died for sinners. Unless I die to make free, you couldn't free a pool cat. You die to make men free? You out of your mind? You can't free anybody? He that commits sin to the servant of sin, if the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And he folks going over to Russia and let them out of the concentration camps? They're over there. You going to die to free them? Don't kid me. Boy, I touched a raw spot there, didn't I, brother? You know. <laughs> well, some of you folks up north need to learn something, you know. You got to get over something once in a while. You know what that song is about? That song is about a kingdom that's spreading. I got news for you. It ain't spreading. When the northern troops came down south, the colored folks were singing, all oh, the dark masters say, ha, ha, and the darkies say, ho, ho, for it must be that the kingdom am coming in the year of Jubilo. It must be that the kingdom am coming in 1865. <laughs> Some kingdom wanted, boy. I mean, Franco-Prussian War, 1870, Philippine Insurrection, 1890, World War I, 1914, World War II, 1939, Korea, 1950, Vietnam, 1970. That's some kingdom you got there. You better get rid of that king and impeach him, boy, throw him off the throne. Amen, 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 amen. If, Christ, if whoever run that kingdom right now, they need to get dumped off the throne. Whoever run that kingdom. If you got Christ's kingdom, you don't know Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ come back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you'll find out what the kingdom is. But that's there. It ain't there. Now, you know what God did for you there? He gave you one, two, three, four, break. And when he brought you in the Antichrist kingdom, he skipped 2,000 years. He went one, two, three, four, 2,000 years. Up shows the Antichrist with his ten kings. Revelation chapter 17. Ten kings of the Antichrist. Right in there. All right, I'll take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, read there verse 1 down through about verse, uh, verse 8. Daniel chapter 7. And come down 1 through verse 8. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a college education. Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 through verse 8. Now read that there. Give you time to read it. In that passage there, Daniel has a vision by night. This vision he has by night, he's standing by the great sea. That'll be the Mediterranean. And four beasts come up out of that sea. And he said, the first of these, he says, were like a lion. That eagle's wings. And he watched a while, and pretty soon the wings were plucked from that eagle. And uh, it was made to stand upon its feet like a man. All right, then keep on reading down through there. And come on down through there and notice he says that when he uh, saw the next beast come up, the next beast was like a bear. And he lying on his side. And this bear had three ribs in the mouth thereof and in his teeth, and they said, Arise, devour much flesh. And he kept on in there in his vision. He saw a leopard. And this leopard had four wings, and he had four heads. 
And then he kept on looking, and finally he saw in the night vision a dreadful beast, which he doesn't describe, except this dreadful beast has uh, teeth of iron and has uh, seven heads and ten crowns. And this beast uh, devours and tears to pieces all the other beasts were before. All right. In that vision there, he has this first beast here as a lion with wings. And if you picked up Schofield or Larkin or Pember or Lindsay or uh, Salem Kirbon or Weber or Rockwell or any 500, they would tell you that lion matches Babylon. They would then tell you that this bear matches Persia and this leopard matches Greece. They all say that. They all say the same thing. They're all wrong. They're good men, but they're wrong. You say, look, when you think you're right, that bell's wrong. Exactly. Uh, come to verse 1. They couldn't possibly be Babylon. When the old Daniel had that vision in verse 1, what during the reign of Belshazzar? Yeah. You know who Belshazzar was? He was the last king of Babylon. Don't you remember what happened to Belshazzar? <coughs> How many remember what happened to Belshazzar? You folks, you're not going to spend any time in that book. <laughs> He got murdered that night that Darius the Median the Persian took over and came in the Belshazzar's feast and killed him that night after he saw the handwriting on the wall. So Belshazzar is the last king Babylon has. Now in that passage you're looking at there, look at verse 17. When are those kings going to come up? Aren't they going to come up in the future? Doesn't it say these four kings shall arise? Well, that one couldn't be Babylon. So Pemberton, and Schofield, and Larkin, and Gabeline, and Pettengill, and Rockwood are all wrong. Now, the good men, I get talking like this, folk get awful put out with me, you know. Oh, Ruckman this and Ruckman that. No, you, you don't, you miss the point. Those are good men, thank God for them, they write many things. I think the Schofield Reference Bible is the best reference Bible you can get. I don't think you get a better one. Matter of fact, you only mess up about nine notes. And he has more than 8,000 notes in there. If you only mess up nine times eight out of 8,000, you're doing pretty good. So it's a good Bible, and those fellows are good men. But every one of them at some time down the line was tempted to mess with the King James text just a little to prove something that he knew was so. And when he did, the Lord just went boom and slammed the door shut on him. He slammed it on him there. Well, now those kings, whatever they are, they have to come up after Babylon. If that's true, then this lion represents Persia, and that bear is Greece, and that bird Rome, and this bird is 666. In this case, the Lord gave you one, two, three, break, Antichrist. Now that time he went one, two, three, four. That time he went one, two, three. Next time he gonna go one, two. And next time he's going to land on it. That's how the book of Daniel is laid out. And there isn't one prophetic writer that ever even saw the thing. This name now is, name is listed out. Four, three, two, one, boo. And up he shows in Daniel chapter 11. Next time he come over here, going to be Daniel chapter 8. He'll come down to 2. But he'll come down there and then he'll break that thing. Now the question comes up, if these things match these things here, are they really just matchmates to that? I mean, are we actually looking at here at uh, uh, Persia? And this is just another picture of Greece, another picture of Rome? Why do you repeat that? Why do you do the same thing twice like that under different figures? Well, the, the explanation given by the Schofield notes and by Larkin and Gabelon and the rest of them is, that men see uh, their kingdoms as something great for man, but God sees the king of this world as wild beasts. See, that fight each other and rapacious and bloodthirsty. And that sounds real good. Unfortunately, it isn't true. For example, none of these beasts fight. Did you notice that? The passage you read right there said one of them showed up and the other one showed up. But they don't fight. This bunch here fight. I mean, Persia conquers Babylon in warfare, Greece conquers Persia in warfare, and Rome conquers Greece in warfare, but these birds don't fight. They just show up. Now you take that one right there with the wings on right there, that lion 
stand up there. That bird's got wings on him. And wings are a funny thing in the Bible, especially a winged lion. That'd be a strange thing. As a matter of fact, a winged lion is so strange that uh, the dictionary has a, a peculiar word for him that you don't often find. It's called a griffin. A winged lion is a griffin, G-R-I-F-F-I-N. There's only one place you'll find a griffin, and that's the coat of arms of the English flag. It's the Englishman, that bird. Now, that isn't conclusive in itself, but when you consider the fact the Jews have only gone back to Israel two times, and both times they went back under a Gentile king, you got your problem. Because the first one that told them to go back is the king of Persia, Cyrus. And the next one that tells them to go back is King George of England, 1917, bow four declaration. Only two times those Jews were in captivity and told to go back, and the first time was the king of Persia, and the next time was the king of England. That thing there is a type of England, Persia, sure as you live and breathe. And that thing had eagle wings. The sun never set the British Empire. Britannica ruled the waves. Da -da -tum -da -da -tum -da -tum -tum -da but you know what Britain is today? It's a bankrupt nation. England today is a fifth-rate world power. Japan's ahead of it, America ahead of it, Germany's ahead of it, and Israel's ahead of it. Amer uh, England today is a bankrupt nation. They got the wings plucked. All right, he goes down there. One, two, three, four. Now what about that next one? If that is England, if this, if this is before Christ, if this is the church age, and chance of 21 it is because Daniel said he had the vision by night, and the church age is night. My whole eye comes as a thief in the night. You shine like a light that shines in a dark place till the day dawn. Who would you guess that was? Anybody take a guess? If that's England, who would that be? Russia. Watch Russia. You couldn't miss it. You say, why? They have the Greek alphabet and they're Greek Orthodox. They were before the Bolshevist Revolution. The ones over right, right now are still tied up with that thing. When I went over there to preach, the biggest trouble I had over there was the fact that the Baptists didn't believe in eternal security because they came to the Greek Orthodox Church and they used wine in the communion. I mean, fermented liquor in the communion. Greek Orthodox. We went down to baptize the converts. We met by a big lake, got out there, and they all were wearing baptismal robes, and they had gave them flowers for being baptized. And the two fellows spoke, I spoke, and then another, another fellow, a Baptist preacher, spoke. And the first Baptist preacher got up I, and got talking. I said to my uh, tra translator, my interpreter, I said, what's he saying? What's he talking about? And he told me what that fellow was talking about. And that fellow was talking about... Uh, Baptism is a regenerating factor. So when I got up, I made him sure, have him sure understand it was just a figure of your salvation. But that's that Greek Orthodox influence. They got it all over that country. That thing there is a, is a, is Russia. What are the three ribs? I don't know. But I know what they said. They said, arise, devour much flesh. And boy, they did. Now, who would this be? That one came up and went down, and Russia didn't fight it, and Russia came up and just went down <laughs> without a fight, and in steps this bird. I wonder what that could be. Now, you see that leopard? That leopard is a funny-looking thing. That thing ha is yellow-brown all over, like an Asiatic, and has a white stomach, like a European, and he has black spots all over him like an African. He's integrated. He's a melting pot. That spot on that beast, the ones that are not like this are like this. They're what you call a rosetta. And a rosetta is like a big pair of black lips pressed right on that skin. Now who could that be? And he got four wings up here. And he matches Rome. If you want to look out for somebody in the United States, you don't have to worry with Russia or China or Japan for a minute. You better look out for Rome, what you better look out for. Now, if that's the United States, 
and I teach it is, then the United States has to get two more states. Because that bird got four wings. I think he got four heads. Are four heads on there? He got four heads, I think. All right. Then he got to get two more states. I've taught that for 40 years. I taught that before Hawaii and Alaska came in. Now you got two of them, now you need two more. I don't know what they'll be, but if I'm right, there'll be two more stuck in there. You say, why? America has to have an even multiple of 13. It can't be 48. You can't divide 48 by 13. You've got to have a full deck, 52. You say, why? Because this country began with 13 states. And on your dollar bill, there's an eagle over there, and he got 13 stars and 13 stripes and 13 olive leaves in his left hand and 13 arrows in his right hand, and it says, E pluribus unum, 13 letters. You can't beat that thing with a stick. I mean, the first flag said, don't tread on me, a dismembered stake, with 13 letters in the description. Well, the South couldn't have possibly won the Civil War. They had the wrong flag. A stupid flag to put an X on it. Did you ever study words than an X? <laughs> it's got an X on it and 13 stars in it. You might just well sign your death warrant, man. Put up something like that. It's 13. So if that's the U.S., you've got two states to go. Now come on down in the passage, 21 to 26. In 21 to 26, you come upon a beast who's not described. But I know what he looks like. You say, how do you know what he looks like? Go to the book of Revelation, you can find what he looks like. And this is a wild-looking beast here. he got seven heads and ten horns. But I know what his body is. Turn to Revelation 13. He's got the body of a leopard. He's like the U.S. and A. Revelation 13, verse 2. I know something else about him. He speaks English. He's got a mouth like a lion. Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. Like a leopard, mouth like a lion, and feet like a what? A bear. This beast here has ten horns. What for? That's them ten toes. That's old 666. Not just a kingdom. Revelation 13, verse 18. Here's the mind that hath wisdom, that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That time he went one, two, three, break, up showed the devil. When he shows up, he's likened to a composite beast. The word for beast, plural, in Hebrew is this. And that ain't no dinosaur. No matter what the Creation Society in California says about it. They just blew it. Behemoth means beasts. And this Antichrist likened to three beasts. A monster. A leopard. And a lion. And a bear. So that beast is a composite of those three when he shows up. What is he? He's mainly integrated. He's the United States. But he talks English, universal language, and politically, he is Billy Clinton. <laughs> he's a communist. Right through and through. What you call, uh, years ago, a Bolshevist was a communist, and what you call back in the 60s a political activist was a communist, and now they call them environmentalists. You change the name. It's the same system. Environmentalist means, what can I do to prove that you have no right to control your own property? That's what that means. Oh, we don't have time this morning. You ought to see the stuff that's going on in this country. All over Florida, they're coming down there and saying, you can't build on that property. You can't build there, and you can't build there. It's your property. You're paying taxes on it. You can't build why It's wetland. An old Jew down there bought him a piece of property, I think it was costing four million dollars. And finally it was nothing but, but just trees and stuff, so he cleared the stuff out and cleared out, uh, I think it was something like a uh, hundred acres. He cleared it out to build him some condominium stuff there. Time chain the government said, you can't do that. It's wetland. You can't build nothing on there. Replant the trees you cut down. Yeah. And he said, but it's my land. They said, yeah, but we, the environmental agency condemned it. And he said, but I'm paying taxes on it. Well, if you want to give rid of the taxes, give the land to the government, you won't have to pay taxes on it. Amen. 
That's what you call uh, ecological environmentalism. Yeah. It means you lose your shirt. Yeah. All right, it's a communist form of government, and it's run by the United States, and it's the English talking government. So the final language, universal language, is English. Therefore, what you need is an English Bible. And I didn't say American. English. The speech is English. <laughs> One, two, three, break. Up show the devil. Now I'll turn to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, read verse 3 to verse 7. Daniel chapter 8, verse 3 to verse 7. Daniel 3, verse 8 to 7. No, not 8 to 7. <laughs> Daniel chapter 8, verse 3 to 7. Daniel chapter 8, verse 3 to verse 7. Give you time to read it. By that vision there, Daniel there says he was by this river, Ulalai, and he saw this ram coming out. And this ram was coming out of the east, and he's going west. And this ram is coming out, and uh, he's tramping out everything and having him a time, and, and uh, tearing up for the other animals and enjoying himself. And about that time, a he-goat, a he-goat comes from the west. And he comes so fast, thundering across there, he doesn't even hardly touch the ground. He's flying. And he has a notable horn between his eyes. And this he goes slams into this ram and tears him up and stomps all over him. And then when he does, this big horn is busted. And out of this big horn comes four horns like this. And then one of those horns plucks up the other ones and one of those horns becomes green and waxes great to the host of heaven, and has eyes in it, and a mouth speaking great things like a man. Now take your Bible there in Daniel chapter 8, and look at that thing in verse 20 to 24. And notice that's the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 8, 20 to 24. And that's him. Daniel chapter 8, 20 to 24. You see the horn there in verse 8 to 13? Comes out in 8, chapter 8. And come at verse uh, 8 to 13, and then chapter 20, or verse 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, it's, it's the devil. Now, what did the Lord do that time? He gave you one, two, break, Antichrist. When you get in the next chapters, chapter 9 and 10, he just gives you one, the Antichrist. When he gets chapter 11, up shows the Antichrist. Now the Lord is scarfing that thing down for you as you draw near to it. And as you draw near it, he's giving you the stuff over and over again. Now I tell you who that ram is. That ram, he says, is Persia. And he says that goat that ran into him is Greece. Like that. But as you near this time, Greece busts up into four groups. And the Antichrist comes out of one of them groups. Now this thing here is what you... This here used to be called Persia. They now call this thing Iran. This thing here used to be called Assyria in here. Now it's called Iraq. All this area from here to there used to be called Syria. But now Syria is blocked off here and blocked off here by Transjordan. But that used to be all called Syria in the Bible. Now, in the Bible, the name for this place here is Assyria. And the name for this place over here is Persia. When Alexander the Great dies, historically, back here with Greece, his kingdom is busted into four pieces, and the Antichrist comes out of one of them pieces. Now, Schofield got a good note in that somewhere in, in Daniel chapter 8. Uh, anybody see it there? Maybe it's in the margin. But there'll be a note there saying that he busted in the four piece. Those four pieces are named. Anybody got it there? Look around your footnotes there in Daniel chapter eight. We're talking about the about the three horns, the four horns. The four empires. Yeah. 
It says four empires into which Alexander's That's it. empire was divided about BC 300. Right. Greece, Asia Minor. Why not? It's slow now. What? Greece. All right, Greece go back over here. Go ahead. Asia Minor. Asia Minor. That's up in here. Including Syria. I included Syria. Egypt. Egypt. The East. All right. And the East. The East, it says. Egypt, the East. Egypt, the East. It says Asia Minor, including Syria, Egypt, the East. Well, he's got Greece, one. Asia Minor, two. Syria, three. Egypt, four. The Antichrist comes out of one of those areas. One of those areas. All right, now, he says Asia Minor, do you say including Syria? Including Syria, Egypt, the East. Okay, all right. All right, now one of these four here, the Antichrist is going to show up from in here. Now, this thing here, Iraq, that part of Iraq there is called Syria in the Bible. Now it's Iraq. This place here is between two rivers. The Euphrates runs down here, and the Tigris runs over here. So the upper part of this is called Mesopotamia, which means bet uh, between the rivers. See, mezzo, mezzo soprano, it's a middle soprano. Mezzo medita in the midst of the seas. That thing there is middle, and that potomy is like a hippopotamy, <laughs> a hippo. Potamus is a water horse. The hippo is the horse in Latin, and the potamus is the water. That's between water. One water here, one water there. Well, now, because of that, when you get over in this area right over here looking for the Antichrist, the first thing you run into is Babylon sitting right here. And then here is Saddam Hussein sitting there. And I'm not saying Saddam Hussein is the Antichrist. I'm not saying that, but... Boy, he sure got good credentials. Thirteen letters in his name. His foreign ambassadors are Roman Catholic. And all his domestic servants are Roman Catholics. And he, with the Pope, agrees that Israel should not be in the land and doesn't recognize Israel as a state. That isn't all. He's in the land called Assyria. That's one of the greatest titles to the Antichrist in the Bible, the king of Assyria. Isaiah chapter 10, Chronicles and Kings. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, is one of the greatest types of Antichrist in the Bible. Man, second only to Nebuchadnezzar. So, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein is in some company. Now, I don't think he's the Antichrist, but you notice as history goes on, as you get closer to it, the Lord narrows in and narrows in and narrows in and narrows in until finally, there it is. Hitler is a good type of Antichrist. He's not the Antichrist, though, but it keeps getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And that's the closest you ever got to it right in there. Uh, Reagan said, we're not after the Iraqis, or Bush said it. Bush said, we're not after the Iraqis, we're just after one man. <laughs> you didn't get him. Isn't that strange? How is all your government leaders, your hot government leaders, are all crazy? They're all wimps and gooks. What's wrong with them? What's wrong with them? We're only after one man. Well, where is he? He's popping grapes, you know, and having him a good time, you know, and, you know, income about $20 billion a year out of his oil. He ain't, he ain't worried about that. Why should he be? You can't get him. I know how much money we spend on that desert storm operation? Anybody know? What is the figure? How much? $70 billion. $70 billion. That's to get one man. What a foul up operation. That's almost like Waco, Texas. You talk about a boo boo's job. I mean, who in the military want to get involved in a, in a fiasco like that? Seventy billion dollars to get one man, you couldn't get him? Why? Phone up some of the, some of the boys. Yeah. <laughs> get a contract on him. Chin Gigante is still around. They got Gotti in jail, but Chin is still around. Hey, Chin, 200,000 bucks, boy. Fell in to get whacked. Get Ice Pick Willie, he'll fix it. <laughs> An ice pick costs about 25 cents, you know. Ice pick Willie is sit down in front of next to the theater and reach up like put his arm on him, punch him through the ear with an ice pick. And then when he bleeds to death, you know, mop a little blood out of the ear and then leave him there. And they think he had a, you know, had a hemorrhage, had a, had an attack, you know. He, he killed about 19 of them that way. I mean, you mean to tell me you spent 70 million bucks and can't whack one guy? 
You call that efficiency? <laughs> Bless my soul, I know some fellas, you give them a contract for $500,000, they take care of it less than two weeks. All this stuff, fella has a charm life. <laughs> All right, now you're over in here, and this thing over here, and the Antichrist is going to show up somewhere in there. Now, where are you going to show up? Well, take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 15. Nothing like a King James Bible, clear up CBS, NBC, and CNN. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. In Genesis 15, 18, there's the original land grant that God gave to the Jews through Abraham. Genesis 15, verse 18. If my eyes don't deceive me, it says there, from the river of Egypt to that great river, the river what? Well, that's there. The river of Egypt, the Nile, to the Euphrates, come down the Persian Gulf. That's quite a stretch of land given to the Jews. Somebody said, well, should they be on the west bank of the whole land? That's kid stuff. They got a piece of land more than 600 miles square. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Samuel. Why, it isn't just the land of Palestine that belongs to them. It's three quarters of Syria and all the Arabian desert. They own the whole thing. All right, 2 Samuel. Look at David there in 2 Samuel 8, 3 and tell me what he's doing. In 2 Samuel 8, 3. David no, no sooner becomes king of the Jews in Jerusalem. And what does he do? He goes up there northeast to recover his border at where? He goes right up to here. Slam to recover his border. Come to First Kings. Look at Solomon when he's reigning. Solomon is reigning. First Kings. First Kings chapter four. Look at verse twenty one and twenty four. 1 Kings chapter 4, 21 and 24. The Bible has got the answer. Have you noticed that far we've progressed so far, I haven't quoted one Hebrew word or one Greek word? Have you noticed that? Isn't it amazing how much is in there that you can't find in the Greek and the Hebrew? Isn't that a strange thing? Tell us what the original language is. Well, you never get anywhere with that, that's for sure. All right, 1 Kings chapter 4, look at verse 21 and 24. All the king this side of the river and peace this side of the river. He talking about Euphrates. When Solomon was in, everything was peaceful from there to there. You know what that thing kind of looks like a triangle or a pyramid? You know what happened? Oh, Noah got in a ship, and not a ship, he got in a box, and he floated around there for about a year or so. When he came out, he landed right here, Mount Ararat. And the the Lord said, get out of that ship, or box. He got out. When he got out, the Lord said, okay, I'll tell you what, buddy. Everything on that side belongs to Japheth. And everything on that side belongs to Shem. And everything down there belongs to Ham. It's the apex of a pyramid. Like that. And it goes to show you something else. It shows this universe, if it has any shape, Einstein was wrong, as usual. That's the most incompetent blockhead that ever lived, I guess, Albert Einstein. If he had dynamite for brains, he wouldn't have to blow the wax out of his ears. And somebody says, how dare you talk about, well, just keep your mouth shut a while, maybe you'll learn something. If a man that professes that smart, all he can produce is a bomb that'll blow you to kingdom come, what good is he? Tell me something Einstein ever did for anybody. Your pastor's done more for people than Einstein ever did. What did he do for anybody? The smart man, smart, what do you ever do for anybody? Tell me. Never had, never had any family, never had any children. Did everything for his kid, never did nothing with your kids. Some a bunch of formulas that get you killed, fool around with something so small you can't even see it. Gee, what a brain. God deliver us from those kind of brains, okay? We can do it with some brainless folks if that brain, might they get rid of them. But if the universe has any shape, it has to be shaped like that. Because the devil said, I'm going to ascend the sides of the north. And Mount Zion, beautiful situation to see the great king. Mount Zion located on the sides of the north. It's got to be a thing like that. 
You know why it has to be a thing like that? Because God is a trinity. A one, a two, a three. <laughs> everything in this universe is a manifestation of God. There's a book written by a fellow called The Answer to Everything. He's a Lutheran. And that book now has a changed title. I think it's now called The Secret of the Universe. I think it's called now. But that book is a book that shows that everything that's real has three parts to it. If it doesn't have three parts to it, it doesn't exist. The theme of that book is the fourth dimension is reality. It isn't time. Time has three dimensions. It's past, present, and future. Einstein wrong again, as usual. <laughs> you know what this is right here? This is the fourth dimension. What is it? It's a combination of three dimensions. It's space, width, height, or space, breadth, length, three dimensions. Time, past, before we got here, present, we're here, future, you out the door in a while. <laughs> Everything in the world is like that. Old Testament, the law, the writing, the prophets. New Testament, the gospels, the acts, the epistles. Peter, James, John, New Testament. Old Testament, Christ, Moses, and Elijah. What's a family? A man, a woman, and a child. North America, Central America, South America here, Africa, Asia, Europe there. Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> the only answer is yes, no, maybe. There's three of them. Everything you fool with has three things to it. Everything got three things to it and even there. See this line? It has a length, it has a width, it has a breadth. You said it's got two dimensions, that long, that wide. No, the chalk's on the paper. It's got a measurement in depth. If you don't have three parts to it, it ain't there. So I've got, I've got time with no past. You can't have time with no past. If you've got time, there's something before you started and after you get through and while you're there. You understand? I mean, you're tall, shorter in the middle. If so I'm in Navy Marine Corps and you're fighting on the sea, the land, the air, it's going to be three no matter what you do with it. It's three. So it's going to be like that. There got to be three races, Jim, Ham, Japheth, because you have a body and a soul and a spirit and there's Father and Son and Holy Ghost. You can, what's the first set of school? It's uh, primary, grade school, middle school, junior high, high school, three, break. Now, junior college, college, post-grad, three of them. If it ain't three, it ain't there. <laughs> well, I just got this thing like this. David over here, Shem over here, Ham down here. Who does this belong to? Right in the middle of Shem, Ham, and Japheth? Well, he's not numbered among the nations. It's Israel. So his 12 tribes get this piece of land. And the millennium, that's their land. Then the desert shall blossom like a rose. Weber and Rockwood misled you. They made you think it was artificial irrigation around Galilee. Blew it again, didn't you, buddy? It's this one out here. Bituminous pitch and sand blossoms like a rose. And the Jew gets the whole script. All right, now, take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 31. Get that in one hand. Now, I told you it's going to be heavy this morning, okay? It's going to be heavy now. And Deuteronomy 26. Deuteronomy 26 and Genesis 31. Deuteronomy 26 and Genesis 31. Now, in Deuteronomy 26, one of the strangest things that ever occurs in the Bible, and nobody ever noticed it, nobody talks about it, nobody mentions it, nobody ever figured it out, but there it just sits there. One of the weirdest verses in the Bible, Deuteronomy 26. In Deuteronomy 26, look at verse 5. God tells that Jew, when you come up these feasts to worship me, you're to come here and offer this fruit basket and hold this stuff up. And when you do, you're to say, uh, my father was a Syrian, ready to perish, and he went down to Egypt. I thought Jacob was a Jew. How did he get converted into a Syrian? In the past, he's a Syrian. You're to say, my father was a Syrian. I wonder why he didn't say Jew. All right, go back to Genesis 31. Now, I don't know how much you read your Bible, but probably not enough. But anyway, back in the Old Testament, Jacob ran from uh, Esau, thought he was out to kill him. He went up here, and he got up here to Haran, right on the triangle, where his Abraham came from when Nahor, his daddy, died. When he got up there, he found his kinfolk up there, Laban. 
the Syrian. All right, Genesis chapter 31, and Genesis chapter 31, look at verse 24, where Laban is called the Syrian. That's where Jacob got his wives from. All four of Jacob's wives are Syrians, they're not Jews. The Syrians, all four of them. Rachel, Rebekah, Zilpah, and Leah, that begat the twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes of Israel come from Syrian women. Four of them. And when Jacob's up there, he's up there 20 years as a Syrian, working with Laban the Syrian. So when he comes back down, he says, uh, Lord, tell him, you come up worship my feast, you come up there and say, a Syrian was my father, ready to perish, and all that kind of stuff there. All right, then one day, Jacob gets uptight about Laban. Laban and the sons don't look at him like they used to, and, and Jacob is making a cleaning, cleaning up on Laban. And he decides to run and take off at night without telling Laban. And Jacob takes off and starts down through here with all his crowd with him, his twelve sons and his four wives, heading back to the promised land. And every time that Jew leaves that Gentile, he always robs him before he goes. <laughs> and takes everything with him. Last time he did that, he left Egypt. You know what he did when he left Egypt? He spoiled the Egyptians. Took all the stuff with him. And that time when he goes, he takes all Laban's his daughters, grandchildren, and all the cattle and stuff and stuff with him, and off he goes. Which means that if you want to find where all the gold is today, it'd be in three places. It'd be in Rome, the Vatican would have it, don't you worry about that, and it'd be in Frankfurt. Ripke, the German economist, took care of that about 20 years ago. He said, Ripke, the German economist, said, Keynes, you spell it Keynes, K-E-Y-N-E-S, the German, the English, you know, uh, inflator. He said Keynes bankrupted this country out of Hitler like he bankrupted England and bankrupted FDR, but Ripka said the answer is get the gold back. So for 20 years, from 1960 to 1980, Ripka in Germany got the gold into Frankfurt from the Chase National Bank and probably the Louisville or wherever that money is stored, Knoxville, and got the stuff in there and Germany got back on the top, that bird. So if you want to get the gold, it's in Frankfurt and Rome, and it could only be in one other place, Jerusalem. Because those of you went back, and when they went back, they had to take something with them. They'd take it every time they go. I don't know. That's why a Gentile doesn't like a Jew, you know. A Jew can get money, and a Gentile loves money. That's why I don't like that. That Jew has a way of making money that's just, you know, it's just fantastic. You can't, it's a, it's a kind of a talent with him or something. I have a joke about that. I think Bing Crosby sang Ava Maria and 10,000 Protestants joined the Catholic Church and Pat Boone sang Peace in the Valley and 10,000 Catholics joined the Protestant Church. Eddie Fisher sang There's a Gold Mine in the Sky and 10,000 Jews joined the Air Force. <laughs> they went back and as sure as the war when they went back they took the gold with them. All right, here goes Jacob sailing down here, and he gets down to Gilead, which is here. And when he gets there, he has that uh, uh, encounter down there. And uh, when he gets down there, he's, Laban chases him. And Laban comes, catches him, catches him down here at Gilead. And now when you're reading there in Genesis 31, look at that stuff going on there in verse 44 to 52. Those two make a covenant, 44 to 52. And they make a covenant right there. That's called Transjordan. Now look at that covenant they make. If I pass over you to do you harm, or you pass over this to do me harm, the Lord isn't with either one of us. And God forsake the guy that crosses this boundary and breaks this here covenant. So Laban says, no Syrian can cross there without breaking the covenant, and no Jew can cross there without breaking the covenant. And that's what they set up. Now, if you know your Bible, and I stand in doubt of you sometimes, brethren, and I'm not making fun of you because you're not educated. I, I don't ever make fun of people because I'm not educated. If I'm, if I'm cutting you hard, it's because of your laziness and your indifference to the book. Yeah. The education got nothing to do with it. Got nothing to do with it. But if you have time, like some of you do, don't spend that book. You'd be being very foolish and very unwise. 
But if you know your Bible, you know in the tribulation, the Antichrist makes a covenant with that Jew. And the middle of the week, he breaks the covenant. Remember that saying? Oh, that Antichrist then is coming from here, 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 or here. And when he comes, he crosses there and breaks that covenant. So he's probably coming from there. Hence we teach the Antichrist will be a Syrian Jew. Now to be a complete Antichrist, he has to be a composite. He's got to be a, I, I guess we call them down south, we call them quadroons, octroons, and sambo. We have, we have names for each mixture down there, you know. The, the scientists have lost track of that, they're not scientific anymore. But quadroon is fourth colored, octroon is eight colored. Uh, I call them high yellow down there. The yellow rose of Texas is an octroon. We know that or not. Contend the yellow rose of Texas beats the bell to Tennessee. That's a woman who's one eighth black. That that thing is, and about a, and about three about three parts Indian and then about four parts white. <laughs> Live and learn. Well, anyway, this Antichrist has to have in him the elements of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right. First of all, this bird got to be like Japheth. He's got to have Gentile blood in him. Well, that Syrian up there is a Gentile because that's where Abraham came from, and Abraham came from Eber, and Eber came from Noah, and those people were Gentiles. And Abraham got the circumcision covenant. He's a Gentile. Noah is the father. That they were all Gentiles, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And God called Abraham out and gave him the sign of the covenant. At that, you call them Jews. All right, he got that. He has to be a Shemite. He got to be a Shemite, so he has to be an Oriental. To be a Shemite, he has to come from a Gentile seed that branches off into the Jewish tribe. So he's a Jew. Then he has to be Hamitic. And if he's Hamitic, then he's got to be come from this area here somewhere. Because right over Cheer are two countries. And this one here is called Ammon. And this one is called Moab. And Ammon comes from one of Lot's drunken daughters committing incest with him. And Moab comes from one of Lot's daughters when Lot was drunk committing incest with him. And those two boys there, these two girls there that give birth to these two boys by their father, those two girls are the daughters of an Egyptian wife that Lot got in Egypt. You read back there in Genesis chapter 13, there was a family land, and Abraham and Lot went down to Egypt. When they came back, Abraham had an Egyptian maid, Hagar, African. And Lot had no wife when he went down, but when he came back up, he had him a wife. She's African. That thing there is part of Syria in the Bible. Syria comes down to here. What we're looking for is a Syrian Jew will show up, and he shows up in this area, formerly called Syria. That's what he show up. All right, now there are one or two other things. Now here's the here's the hard ones. Turn back to Genesis two. And in Genesis two, this Euphrates shows up again. This time, Euphrates shows up. It's connected with the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter two. Genesis chapter two. Look at verse fourteen. He says, out of, out of Eden, a, a river came and went into four heads, and he named them. And he says, one goes out and compass the land of Ethiopia. So one of these rivers used to go out like this. And one went to Havilah, that's down Arabia, down like this. And another is Hiddekel, and that's the Jewish name for the Tigris. It's right there. And the other river is that great river, Euphrates. Then the Garden of Eden was right there. Now you can't find the other two rivers now because the flood evidently changed the top topography in here and those two rivers are gone, but those two are still here. What is that? Well, that's Kuwait. That's Bosra. That's Basra. That's Ur of the Chaldees. It's right there. That's where God called Abraham out. So if the garden was planted there's Eden, if the garden was eastward in Eden, <laughs> it's right there. 
Now, you know what that means from the standpoint of chronology? It means we're all through, bye-bye, I'm leaving. <laughs> because history has gone clean around, and now you're back in Genesis 2. You can't go any further west. <laughs> you're through. It means history is over. It's over. So as far as the Lord coming goes, it's just a matter of days or hours. We don't know the day or the hour, but it's all over. There's no place to go. You're back where you came from. I'm the newspaper, Desert Storm. It's right there. Kuwait, it's right there. Or the Chaldees, it's right there. There isn't any more. There's no place to go, brethren. You can't, unless you go back to Genesis 1, <laughs> and that's the creation. <laughs> All right, you're sitting over here waiting for the second coming of Christ, and the news media is stuck on this line right here now, and you can't go another step without the Lord coming. So whatever you got to do, you better do it quick. You better put the hammer on the floor. Now, they said the speed limit is 55. That means I'm, uh, what, I'm 16 miles, 55, 65, 10. I'm not a very good mathematician. 16. I'm 16 miles over the speed limit right now. Um, and I intend to floorboard it. I intend to put the hammer on the floor, boy, and go the last couple of yards at the speed of light, brother, because there isn't any time left. Amen. Now, whatever you got to do, get it done. History has gone clear through here and off through Rome and off through Europe and off through England and over the United States and from one seaboard to the other and out into the World War II fighting in Japan, Okinawa, and Tarawa has come across Pakistan and Bangladesh and India and is now right back where it started from. Ain't a foot more to move. Whatever you could do, you better do it quickly. Well, now one more little item. We'll close this morning. You pick up your newspaper and turn in your boob tube, have a nice day, turn off the news, and you read about the West Bank, the West Bank, the West Bank, the West Bank. There isn't any such thing as the West Bank. That's all news media propaganda. In 1948, the UN voted to give that piece of land to that Jew. And they voted uh, unanimously. There were two abstainers, uh, the Pope and Russia didn't like it. But the rest of them said give it to them, and they got it. And the Jew had no sooner moved in there than five Arab nations attacked them. Five of them. And the Jew wiped them out. <laughs> and won all this land in here. Like that. That is now called occupied territory by the news media. It isn't occupied territory, it's Jewish territory. If there are any Arabs on there, they are, they are on the wrong territory. You see why? They attacked the Jews and lost. Now, you know what happened after World War II? We took the Nazi high leaders and brought them to Nuremberg and put them on trial for waging aggressive warfare against peaceful nations. But when that debacle took place and all five of those Arab nations waged aggressive warfare, we never opened our mouth. We opened our mouth. Instead, we say, this land belongs to the Arabs. And the Jews have no business persecuting these poor Arabs. And some of you dumb thumps that spend all your time watching television, you know what you're coming out with? These poor Arab children, these poor displaced refugees. Oh my God, is it awful? The poor little starving children make these people sit on the ground with no water. Oh, these poor Arabs, oh, these wicked Jews. And this woman here got shot, and they shot this teenager. That's what you're getting morning and night. That means your news media is 100% anti-Semitic. That land don't belong to that Arab, it belongs to that Jew. Amen. The Lord said, that's my land, and I'm giving it to Abraham. Now, this is what the nurse Frey Thin. I preach this stuff in churches where there are Arabs sitting there in the building. I mean, the American army being what it is today, you can find it full of Muslims. There are all these air, corp, air, air, air base all over this country. I preach the thing, have five Muslims sitting right there looking at me right through it. When I got through and had them bow their heads in prayer, those mouths never bowed their heads. They just sat there and stared. You know what you find? You find some of those Muslims get saved. Or they become Catholics. And they come around after the service to me. One of them came around to me and said, I'm saved. I'm your brother in Christ. Why do you take the side of the Jew against a brother in Christ? If a Jew is a Christ protector. Interesting question, right? You know why I do? Because the book says it belongs to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
What saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman. Shall not be heir with my son Isaac. Hagar stands for Arabia. Galatians. Chapter 4. Read your New Testament. To help you out. <clears throat> and you get along there, you get in a political issue. God going to take this country and force them to go to hell. He's going to force this country to go against that Jew. But he takes a side with that Jew, then he's going to lose this and lose that and lose it. He's going to lose the Catholic Church and the Vatican and Rome all the way. They don't even recognize Israel as a state. He's going to make America choose. Boy, you're going to stand by the truth. And if you don't, I'm going to fix you. And the Lord's going to fix us, boy and girls. He's going to fix us. You turn against that Jew and you just cut your throat from ear to ear. I mean, every nation ever did it, did it. I, I mean, I'm no, I'm no uh, particular friend of the Jewish people. I don't, Jews kind of irritate me. They really do. Just, just being around them irritates me. I, I remember the Christian Jews irritate me. It just, there's kind of a, kind of a, I don't know what it is about them. It's a kind of a pushiness or kind of, I believe they call it, what do they call it? Uh, they got a name for that in, in what? Arrogance. Yeah, they're arrogant, but they got a name for it in, uh, Assertive. sir? Assertive. Yeah, those English words, but they've got a Jewish word for it. They call it, uh, I'll come in a while. Anyway, I'm no particular, you know, promoter of that kind of thing, but I know what happens to countries that turn against Israel. They're buried. They're buried. I mean, I'd be the closest I ever came to hitting the fellow in the ministry, and I've, I've come maybe three times kind of close to it, but the closest I ever came to it was in a pawn shop in Chicago where I was trying to bargain for a watch, and the guy was an unsaved Jew. And he was taking the name of Jesus Christ, the cuss word, you know, and say, well, Jesus Christ, what do you want for the watch? You think I'm some kind of a... You know, I just gripped my teeth going across that counter and just pounded him to a pulp, man. And I, I got out of there before I, I quit talking. I couldn't stand it in there, you know. So I'm not, I'm not you know, pro-Semitic, but just, they, but you've got to stand by them. Nationally, you've got to do it. I'll bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. The worst thing I ever did in my life, I guess, and I've been saved, was I had a Jewish evangelist come to my church. He was a blind man. His name was Marx. Had a seeing eye dog. The good fella. Save, love the Lord, believe the book. But that pushy, that, that, that uh, you know, he come in, you know, just take over the place when you come in, you know, come in. Well, uh, they know I'm in town. Did you get the spots on the television? Did you buy the place for the newspaper? Well, did you let people know I'm here? Well, of course they know I'm here, but you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, man, you know. One way to ban to start a meeting, you know. Uh, where are you putting me up with? Well, they have the right facilities, you know, and that kind of stuff. Oh, man, you know. And I just kind of irritated him. I wasn't feeling very good in those days anyway. Something was wrong. I don't know. And I, I thought I'd, I'd just kind of get back to this fellow. <laughs> what I've got, I've got more German music in my home than they got in Germany, ma'am. And one thing I got, I mean, I got a, I got a, a recording of a, a parade march by a six-foot division, one of Rommel's uh, panzer divisions, and the, the 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 minimum height in that thing was was six feet. But the rest of them was six two, six three, six four. Guide on six feet, white gloves, jack boots, and the march in this march called Parada March the Long and Carols. It means the parade of the tall fellows. And those guys are so tall, they got the goose step from 120 down to about 90 a minute. And the goose step is no longer this, 120 like this, see? It's one of these things like this, where the, where the boots come up to here like this. And you hear that thing in there, and when a German band gets playing, boy, somebody's going to get shot. It isn't like a, a halftime uh, high school band, you know, college band playing. You know, American bands. You know, that kind of stuff. Those German bands get going, they go, after your guts, boy. And I mean, that thing starts, and you hear them marching. And that thing is going, and those jack boots going, clack, clack. Clack, 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 clack. You know when you're when you're blind, your ears are always sharp than average persons. <laughs> I played it for that Jew. And he sat there and just sweat. I'm the sweat just popped up here and rolled down here and popped up and rolled down here, boy, hear them things coming out. Clack, 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 clack. I got through that thing, he said, 
Where did you get that? <laughs> I felt just mean as the devil, man. I said, I'll never go to a thing like that again as long as I live, man. I let the guy sleep in my bed that night as an atonement for my sins. I really did, man. I really did. I went, I went back and slept on the couch in the back and let him have my bed that night. But you got to take care of him. Now, see a thing right there? That is Jewish territory. And the reason you know those Arabs are a bunch of hypocrites is any Arab has enough money to give every refugee in there $20,000 a week. And they never give them a dime. You know why? They can use them as propaganda. That's why. Don't tell me those oil well barons or those sultans. Don't, don't tell me any of those fellows make less than $5 million a year. Some are 15 and $20 million a year. They give every wretched their $10,000 a week. Never even miss the money. They ain't going to do it. What that, what you're the West Bank. Now, you know what a bank of a river is. You ever sit out in the bank of the river and fish? Or go to the bank of a river? When they say the West Bank, they make you think that's the West Bank of the Jordan River. It's not. It's two-thirds of the land of Palestine. They mean this whole area in here. And now at the Lebanon, they call that the West Bank. Folks, that's your news media. They'll get you killed. They'll lie to you. They'll lie like a dog. Not only does that all belong to the Jew, but that whole thing there belongs to the Jew. And someday when Jesus Christ back comes back, it'll be Manasseh and Gad and Reuben and Issachar and Zebulun and Judah and Benjamin occupying that whole strip right in there. The whole thing will be theirs. That'll be the capital of the world. And eventually the capital of the universe. All right. I've book. I got a book at home called uh, Sieg Heil, and it's one number, one uh, number of uh, one of a number of pictorials in the Third Reich. But it's unique in that it has in it a picture of Hitler's ID card and the Austrian Nazi Party before it came to Germany. The Nazi Party is not a German party; it's an Austrian party. He's an Austrian. He's born in Braunau and raised in Linz. Those Austrians, they have the most Strange proclivity for just tearing everything up. I mean, Sigmund Freud, that's an Austrian. The guy that started World War I, Count Berchtold, he's an Austrian. The one that starts World War II, Hitler, he's an Austrian. The center of the World Food Bank now is in Austria. The center of the Atomic Nuclear Commission is in Austria. It's a bad place. But anyway, I've got his ID card, and on that ID card, it says his number is 555. That's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. Adolf Hitler is a world conqueror, a world European conqueror. And his number is 555. You know who's up next? You know who's up next? You see that thing? The Lord has it set out on a computer. It's mathematized. You know, eight stand for something new. There's your tribulation. There's your millennium. Then the millennium, a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. It's laid out like a computer. If you got in before Hitler, you'd find Napoleon and Charlemagne and Constantine and Caesar. And that bird is a European anti-Semitic. 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 That bird, if he follows an order, will be European anti-Semitic. He has Japhetic blood in him, like a European. But it'd be a half-breed. Or we'd say a third breed. I don't know what you call that. An octroon is a quarter. A uh, quadroon. A quadroon is a quarter. An, uh, a third would be a... What you call that? What would it be? Try something, tree something. Down south, these one third Indian, one third uh, Negro, one third white, you call it a Sambo. But they won't let you use that word. So you, that's one of those forbidden words in the land of free speech, you know, a certain words you can't use. You can't say any mini minor old ketchup, you know, by the toe, you know, it's forbidden. All right, you get down to here like this. Hitler is here, and the next bird in is this bird in here. This bird here will be a Japhetic, Shemitic, 
Hamitic world conqueror, and he'll be anti-Semitic, just like all the rest of them. And you're on the threshold. You're on the threshold. All right, is that enough for you to chew on for a while? Quarter past one. You go and work out a few hours and <laughs> let me know what you find out. All right, brother, come ahead. That's all I have for this morning.